Excellent. All right, let's commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to see you. Just as that hymn said, we want to see you. We want to see you and we want to see your Son, the true and holy one, standing in the light of his glory. And Father, I just pray that today that you would speak through me as we look into the uh, church in Philadelphia, that you may speak using your Holy Spirit to convict those who need conviction and to comfort those who need comforting and to commend those who require commending. Father, I pray all these things to your Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, for the last five Sundays, we have been going through the five, well, five previous, but two left to go, seven churches that are written about in the opening chapters of Revelation. We've seen in the first church, and I'll allow the uh, visuals to catch up, that we are to remember our first love, and that first love is Jesus. We are reminded in the letter to Smyrna to be faithful and not fearful. We are reminded in the letter to Pergamon to not compromise, to not let the things of the world compromise us, to not let false teaching compromise us, which leads into the next one, Thyatira, where we are taught not to be led astray. In Sardis, we have been told to wake up and to strengthen that which remains. And that brings us squarely to the next church, Philadelphia. And I've titled this one, To Hold Fast to Jesus. Why are these letters important? And moreover, why is Revelation important? For a lot of people, we look at this book and we think, gee, that's a scary book. There's a whole lot of stuff which I really don't understand there. So I might just stay away from it. But can I encourage you to look into it? And for this reason, that these these letters and this book to the churches in, to the Church of Philadelphia, to the church as a whole, past and present, and to you personally, are an assurance. They are an, assur- they are an assurance and a testimony of who Jesus is. They are an assurance that Jesus knows. That Jesus knows you and that he loves you and that he has everything in hand. And they are an assurance that what Jesus says will happen, will happen. The book of the Revelation is exactly that. It is a revelation of Jesus. And if he's the one that we love, shouldn't we want to know more about him? But what about prophecy? What about this book as a book of prophecy? Is this, are these letters talking about the ages of the church? Are they talking about things which have been and things which are yet to come? Well, yes, they could be. But can I tell you that that's probably missing the whole point. In Revelation 19, verse 10, we read this little bit. Then I fell down at his feet, and this is the feet of an angel, not the Lord Jesus Christ, not God the Father. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. And here's the clincher. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus is the focus and the point and the reason for prophecy. The whole point of it is so that we may know Jesus better, that we may know that he has things in hand. So our focus should not be on the future. 
but it should be on Jesus. It's a testimony. The testimony of Jesus is, quite frankly, the gospel. That if we believe in him, we trust him, we can and will be saved from a lost eternity because he has paid the price. This testimony of Jesus is to make certain our hope in Christ. And I tell you, in our day and age, we need that certainty, that hope. And finally, it is to assure us, most importantly, that we can trust Jesus and that we are known by God. All right, now for a little bit of background and some pretty, pretty visuals, hopefully. So we're looking at Philadelphia, and you might think, where is Philadelphia? Well, here's a map which we've probably all seen before, and if we hit the button, a little arrow will point to Philadelphia. Got me a little bit interested. I decided to have a look at it in the real world, so I went out and mapped all the cities and where they sit in the real world. So this is, this is an image from Google Earth. And you can see there the Isle of Patmos down the bottom. You can see Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and next week's church, Laodicea. All within this area, all within this area of Asia Minor, or, as we know it, Western Turkey. I'm assuming I got my directions right there. Philadelphia is roughly 44 kilometres to Sardis. And it is roughly 77 kilometres to Laodicea, down there in the bottom corner. It has a connection to Smyrna, up here in the top corner here, and it also has a connection to Pergamon. The connection to Smyrna is from the Bishop Polycarp is said that when Polycarp was martyred in the uh, Colosseums, or the amphitheatre rather, rather, in Smyrna, that Philadelphian believers were martyred alongside with him. Which is quite fitting considering the name that Philadelphia has, the town of brotherly love. But we'll get to that in a moment. It's no accident that the letters that our Lord has sent to these two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, carry the same points, or very similar points. You don't see any rebuke levelled at Smyrna or at Philadelphia. However, they are commended. They are commended in much the same way. Of all the seven churches, of all the seven churches, two are without rebuke. Pergamum, I mentioned it. There it is up the top there, the little yellow one with the arrow underneath it. Why is this church linked to Philadelphia? Well, it's got something to do with the founding of the city. I'll grab the next slide. These two handsome young men were brothers. Eumenes II was actually king of Pergamum and the Pergamos sort of empire, if you will. In 172 AD, Eumenes, however, was returning from Rome and he was set upon and feared to be dead. His brother, Attalus II, on hearing of the death of his brother, took his role, not in a way that you would expect, but he took his role as king and as husband to his wife. Because in those days, what marriage was about was about protection of those who were vulnerable, namely women. So he stepped up. But Eumenes hadn't died. A bit of controversy there. What does Italus to do? He does the thing a true brother would do. He steps back. He renounces the kingdom and he divorces the wife whom he took, his brother's wife. Because rightfully, they were Eumenes. The 
later on in life, Attalus was approached by the Romans and was asked to usurp his brother, to overthrow him. But Attalus was faithful to his brother, out of love for his brother. And his brother was sick at the time, so he could have, he could have pulled this off. But he didn't, out of a love for his brother. This brotherly love that Attalus showed for Eumenes got him the title Philadelphus, meaning literally one who loves his brother. And Eumenes founded a city and named it after him, the church, in which we find the church which we are looking at today. After his death, Attalus took his place as king after his brother and adopted his son and married his wife to carry on his legacy. It was how much he loved his brother. After his death, Attalus's death, in 133 BC, his son bequeathed the kingdom to the Roman allies. This included Pergamos and Philadelphia and the Romans then combined the province of Iconia, which is along the coast including Smyrna and Ephesus with the province of Pergamos to form Asia Minor. Philadelphia was founded on an earthquake prone region This region, and I'm going to make a mess of this name, is Catechumene. Out I go. <laughs> it quite literally means <coughs> burnt country. That's because of a volcano which is nearby. And this volcano was responsible for an earthquake. This earthquake in AD 17 was so massive that it pretty much levelled the city of Philadelphia. And it had multiple aftershocks after it, which had a psychological effect on the people of Philadelphia. Now keep this in mind, because later on we're going to touch on this with regards to what Jesus is talking to this church about. This effect, this psychological effect, was so bad that 20 years after the earthquake, the last tremor, they were still living in tents in the area. The temples in this city were built on a foundation of beds of charcoal which were covered with wool fleece. The foundations would pretty much float whenever they were on in an earthquake. So quite Quite simply, the temples in this town were the safest place to go. And when an earthquake would happen, people would actually run into these. The foundations were bolted together with iron plates so that they wouldn't fall apart, but they had this, this effect, kind of like modern skyscrapers do today, where they are counterweighted to sway in an earthquake or to sway in heavy wind. In the Byzantine era, it was known as Little Athens. This was due to the amount of temples which was in it. But still, there was a Christian influence there. There was a Christian church there which remained faithful dur during this entire period of about a thousand years. Despite the change in culture, the Philadelphian church stayed true much like these pillars. And this is modern day Philadelphia. The city still exists. However, it has changed because the Ottoman Empire eventually took over the place, but thankfully it was peaceful. But despite all this, there is still a Christian remnant. 
In the modern era, however, the city was burnt during the Greco-Turk War. And the survivors moved to Athens, where they set up a suburb called Near Philadelphia, pretty much New Philadelphia. This town, however, Philadelphia, has been renamed. And the rename, and I'm going to mispronounce this as well, Al-Shahir. Hey, that wasn't too bad. It's a corruption of the words City of God. And this is key once again because this will come up in what the Lord Jesus has to say to Philadelphia. And there at the bottom you can see the pillars. But different to the ones we had before in the Roman temples, these are from the Basilica of St. John, the guy who is penning this letter. So let's get into our passage of scripture. I'll do a bit of reading first here. If you want, you can turn to uh, Revelations 3, verse 7, and we'll uh, continue on until verse 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the keys of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts, no one will open. I know your works. Be behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have a little power, and yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the world, to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the seven churches. Did you catch that? Pillars, temples, doors. We'll get into this a little bit. Jesus introduces himself as the Holy One, the True One, and the One who has the keys to the city of David. Sorry, just messing with my tech. In Isaiah 40, verse 25, we read that he is beyond compare, that there are no other gods which can match him. In Revelations 4, verse 8, we read that he is holy and that his holiness is declared in heaven without cease, day and night. In Luke 4, verse 34, he is recognized by demons, but he is feared by them. It says there that he is the Holy One of God. And I apologise if it's a little bit dark there. In John 6, 68 and 69, he is referred to as the Holy One and the One in whom we have eternal life.
Jesus is the Holy One. He is God, made flesh. He is God in human form. He is the one who took upon uh, on him the sacrifice that buys us entry into heaven. He is the one who took what we deserved. He is holy. In Hebrews 1, 2 and 4, we read this. Sorry, I've forgotten something. In Revelation 6, 10, we read that he is also the holy avenger of the martyred saints. That you, you are killed for your faith. He will avenge you. That verse reads, They cried out with a loud voice, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? But Hebrews 1, 2 and 4, we see that he is the radiance of God. That in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he has created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Jesus is also the true one. Now, I've got a little quote here from Jordan Peterson, which uh, was, he said this in, during a uh, podcast with Joe Rogan in the Joe Rogan Experience. And if you want that podcast number, I can uh, give you it. It's uh, probably interesting, but I wouldn't hold too much of it. But this, this point on the Bible caught my eye, caught my ear. It says, it isn't that the Bible is true. It's that the Bible is the precondition for the manifestation of truth, which makes it way more true than just true. It is a whole different kind of truth. And I think this is not only literally the case, but factually, I think it can't be any other way. The precondition of the manifestation of truth, way more true than just true. It's almost as if he's talking about something which is the basis or the foundation for truth. But what is the Bible? Well, the Bible is the true story of God and humanity. It outlines how we fell, how we failed, how Jesus had to come to purchase us and restore our relationship. Jesus being God came to save us and restored our relationship. Just let that sink in for a moment. God comes to restore the relationship. Nothing we can do can do it. The Bible is about why Jesus came, and it is about Jesus. In John 17, 16 to 17, we read this. I have given them your word. Keep in mind the words which I've highlighted there, or lowlighted as the case of the colours may be. I have given them your word, and the word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Whenever I see the word, word, in the Bible, I think, is this meaning the same as John 1? 1? In the beginning was the word. And lo and behold, in this particular scripture, it is the same Strong's word. It is logos, the word. And the word embodies an idea, a statement. Can I be so bold as to say that that statement is in the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua, which literally means salvation? The other word there which I highlighted was also truth. And this word, with reference to what Jordan was saying, is truth. But it is not merely truth as in spoken truth. It is the truth in idea. It is the truth of reality, of sincerity. It is the truth in the moral sphere. It is divine truth revealed to man and it is straightforward. So, your word is truth. Jesus, the word, the statement from God is truth. And that truth is he is offering salvation. And this truth is the basis for our, re- our reality. This declaration is the foundation of truth for this reality, for our reality. It is that despite our plight, Jesus saves. God has declared in reaction to our sin that I will save you. But this declaration is no mere fact because it is a person. It is the person, Jesus. It is a truth which you can know personally. In John 3, uh, John 8, 32 rather, we read, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You can know this truth personally. In John 14, 6, he is the person of truth says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is how we can know God. To know Jesus, you know God. To know Jesus, you know the truth. And finally, Jesus identifies himself as the one who has the keys of David, who opens no one will shut, and who shuts no one will open. The keys of David refer to this heavenly city of David, Jerusalem, having authority to say who can enter and who does not. And he does that by purchasing us through his salvation. It's a fulfillment of the Dravidic covenant, which is an unconditional covenant of the Messiah. And we can see that in Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7. It is an assurance that those who place their trust in Jesus will be part of this kingdom, that Jesus will rule without end, and that as in John 10 verse 9 and in 14, 6, He alone is the way, the door, in which you enter this kingdom. What does this mean to Philadelphia? Well, it means that they have a sanctuary and security in the face of hardship, in the face of persecution. The faithfulness and the trueness of Christ far exempt exceeds the example of our friend Attalus II or any other earthly king for that matter. 
this assurance is offered to us as well. If we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8 reads, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have a little power and yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. This is testament to the faithfulness that Philadelphia has already shown. John has a reoccurring theme in his writings that Jesus is the almighty God and that he knows. He knows you, he knows your circumstance, he knows what's happening inside your heart. He knows the things you do in secret and the things you do in public. And we see this through the letters. We see in Revelation 2 verse 9 that the tribulation of Smyrna is known to him. Actually, that might be the wrong church. Sorry. We know that in uh, Revelation 2.13 that he knows where that church dwells. And that we know that for five churches, he proclaims that he knows their works. An open door which no one can shut. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. This is either the promise of salvation eternally or this is an opportunity to bring salvation to others. In Colossians 4 verse 3, we see that there is a chance to bear witness for Christ. At the same time, I pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Note that there is hardship there, but it is still seen as an opportunity, an opportunity to show what Jesus is all about. But a little power. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Christ, Christ's power is shown in our weakness. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. That even though we think we don't have the power to get up and worship God, to get up and proclaim his glory, to stand up in front of a church and lead a worship service, preach, give something out in an open time of worship, he is made manifest in our weakness. He makes us strong to be able to do that. And he is glorified because of it. You have kept my word in 2 Timothy 1 verse 12. We see that I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able, verse. Convinced that he is able to guard until that day what he has entrusted to me. What has he entrusted to you? Salvation. Salvation has been entrusted to you. And that if you are faithful to that end, he will guard you to that end. He will keep that faith in your heart. Do not deny his name, but share in the persecution. Share in the glory of proclaiming the Lord's name. You see that in Revelation 2 verse 13, the persecution which is happening for Smyrna and for Pergamum as well, because... Antipas, as referenced in this verse, was from Pergamon. He was the guy who got boiled alive inside a 
brass bull for his faith. Polycarp was burnt at the stake from Smyrna. And many of the Philadelphian Christians, though we do not know them by name, suffered this same fate. Put your hope and trust in Jesus, and he will keep you to the end. Verse 9, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down to your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Those who say they were Jews, but are not. This is talking about the hard attitude of these people. That although they were genetically or or ethnically Jewish, they were not considered Jews in the eyes of the Lord. That they had uncircumcised hearts. That they were a nation of Jews, but not spiritually. And they were liars, just like their dad. And that's a pretty, pretty scathing accusation. we skip forward to the quote from Ignatius? Ignatius was one of the guys who wrote to Polycarp and the Philadelphian church, and he had this to say, if anyone preaches the one God of the law and the prophets, but denies Christ to be the son of God, he is a liar. And he goes on to reiterate this. And we know that the father of all liars is Satan. And he says there at the end there, such a person is, is is, his father is the devil. They are liars in deed and word. They misrepresent what Christianity is all about, what Jesus is all about. They misrepresent the God whom they claim to serve and worship. And they attempt to stop the message of salvation. And I think we can see this in the Christian church today. Verse 10 through 12 encourages us to hold on to Jesus. That he will make these people bow down us and we see this in the millennium kingdom that we will rule with the Lord Jesus Smyrna and Philadelphia have similar yet different commendations here in Revelation 2 9 and 10 Smyrna is told to be faithful under this persecution in Revelation 3 10 Philadelphia is urged to be faithful to continue to be faithful because those who are persecuting you will be made low in the end. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep from you, you from that hour of trial that is coming in the world to try those who dwell on the earth. Jesus' prayer for us is found in John 17, and I keep coming back to this part of scripture. John 17, 9 to 11. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. For they are yours, all are yours, and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. And later on it says in there, once again, sanctify them in truth. I am coming soon. And everyone said, hallelujah. Hold fast to what you have. 
so that no one may seize your crown. 2 Timothy 4, 6-8, we read of a crown of righteousness. This is for all who love him. And we see it repeated through the uh, letters to the churches, to hold fast. Sardis is told to hold fast in 3.3. Thyatira in 2.25, to hold fast to him alone. In 2.13, Pergamum, to hold fast. Smyrna, to be faithful. In James 1 verse 12, we read, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive a crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. To the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall never go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. I had a couple of verses about the pillars of truth, but I'll just leave us on this here. You see here the text, which is written on a pillar in the temple. These pillars were donated to the temples by people in the city, by rich people in the city. And it's safe to say that our God is rich beyond all measure. On them was written the name, the city, of whom purchased them. You were bought with a great price. So with your body, glorify the Lord. And finally, we see a picture of St. John's Basilica, and I've zoomed it in. These pillars, in my opinion, are a lot, lot more magnificent, built in a Christian church. Let this be as an image to you. That God is building his church, his temple, and you are a part of it, a pillar of it, if you remain faithful. Have that hope. In Hebrews 4.15 and 16, we are assured in this, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive and find grace to help in the time of need. And this final quote, hopefully it's nice and light. Also. This is from a song which, which is from a Christian band. Uh, it's rather heavy music, so probably just look the lyrics up. What is true joy or hope? Where can it be found? Is it in the promise of golden streets? Is it in the escaping the fires of hell? No. All things are worthless in the view of the surpassing value of simply knowing God and being known by him. Oh, that I may know him. To one day see the Saviour who purchased my life by his very blood to see the king who suffered and died for a sinner such as me. This is our hope. We are known by Jesus and will be known by Jesus. May that hope go with you for the rest of this week and for the rest of your life.